basically looking at alternative models for housing, building housing uh, that falls outside the kind of stuff that's private or state uh, funded uh, initiative. So we'll be looking at self build, uh, we'll be looking at co op, uh, we'll be looking at ambitious projects um, at the London King's neighbourhood co op, LCMC, um, and we have something in Heathrow looking at neighbourhood plans. Um, so the format is essentially I'll get each of the panelists to introduce themselves, give a bit of background um, about what they, they've done and they're doing, um, and then I will give I'll, I'll put four questions to the panel and then we'll open it up to, to everybody um, here to, to ask some questions. So if we can begin with uh, John Broom. Uh, yeah, um, I first got involved in people building for themselves in the late 70s. Uh, the Nourish and Nourish and Self Build with Walter Siegel was the architect and I worked alongside him. Uh, and then Thatcher came and it wasn't a council anymore, it was housing associations and we got self-built co-ops off the ground in South London and elsewhere in Brighton and Birmingham and one or two other places. Um, and my particular interest now is trying to see uh, on the back of the sort of government policy on custom, which is tends to be kind of developed and led, is to see whether there's um, more scope for community-led self-build again, because there hasn't really been any great amount of activity in that area since the last 10 or 15 years, I guess. Uh, and um, we have got a proposal to get a scheme off the ground again in Lewisham building on the back of what happened there some time ago. Thanks. Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Ian from Transition Heathrow. Um, we set up our group about over four years ago down in the Heathrow Villages, which is, I don't know if you know about the uh, third runway campaign. Uh, it's essentially uh, the villages that are just north of Heathrow Airport that were proposed to be demolished and built the third runway. Um, there were plenty of kind of one-off big publicity seeking actions that were done, uh, but there was, there was also a recognition that there needed to be a more embedded uh, source of action to, to really kind of help the, the people, the residents, the community that was there to, to build their own resilience and be able to resist the expansion from the airport. So that's what Transition Heathrow has been doing and for the last couple of years we've been working on putting together a neighbourhood plan for the area which will cover housing, which will cover transport, uh, which will cover green spaces and heritage and all the kind of things you expect to find in a planning document. Um, and we, we've managed to get a bit of funding together to do that. So that's what we're right in the middle of at the moment. Uh, I'm Rob from the Bright Housing Co-op, which is in Walthamstow in North East London. Um, the, the group that originally set up the Bright Housing Co-op um, wanted to set up a new cooperative started in 2010 uh, and we moved into the cooperative that we came to have in 2011. Um, and we were a grassroots organisation, a bunch of people who met together in a pub, um, so quite a lot of people are interested in our story because we weren't state funded, we weren't grant funded, um, none of us are property professionals um, and set up a new co-op is not without really its challenges but uh, I guess I'm here to sort of illustrate that it
Yeah, we're aiming to do it as a self build and we're hoping to do this in central London, in Westminster. So what was the name of your group? Uh, London Community Neighbourhood Cooperative, LCNC. So, yeah. So basically we're at the sort of proposal stage to Westminster. Yeah. So we're getting there. Yeah. Um, right, so I'm just going to pitch, pitch a few questions kind of just for my own. Um, so just wondering what sort of <coughs> movement, movements and struggles, either historical or recent, um, have you found, have either inspired you or, or kind of have worked in actually securing um, additional things like self-built co-ops or, or kind of a, a change in, in policy, access to land, that sort of thing. I mean, just thinking as the radical housing network, what kind of strategies one look at in terms of making this happen. Um, so I'll start on this side. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the old sort of Julie and the custom built thing, um, which we sort of went through and applied for, and in reality it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> um, and that's basically because we had, the only thing missing for us was that we hadn't identified that. Um, Getting land in London is one of the most difficult things for people who don't have sort of 30 odd million plus yet to throw away. So that is the biggest hurdle for any group, yeah, to get through. So, I mean, policy is there, you know, people are saying yes, yes, custom bills and, you know, self build and whatever, but in reality, it isn't working unless local authorities become enablers, yeah, and actually give land or, you know, lease land, give us long leases or something. So, it's just it's not going to happen otherwise. Um, Rob, okay. Uh, in terms of things that have happened in the past, uh, there's a whole history of the cooperative movement, housing co-ops within that, um, and uh, I, I see quite a lot of uh, groups of people getting together on a grassroots basis, wanting to, to, to you know, to tackle these issues, and in so doing, reinventing the wheel and, and, and learning for themselves a whole load of stuff, which actually is access to expertise that already exists in groups that have done this before. Maybe mm -hmm. in different times the specifics were all different, but just in terms of you know how groups work together, how they can make decisions. You know, we all like to say that we like that we make decisions by consensus, but actually, you know, what does that really mean in a real life situation? Um, and also, you know, protest movements. Um, you know, there's, there's umpteen protest camps that have been set up over the years and, uh, you, you know, people have sort of served their time in, in that world. It can bring a lot of knowledge um, about how we can work together effectively when we're doing something which is actually, in some form or another, going to be challenging the system. And, and if we're not organised and if we're not efficient as a group and we don't work together properly, then we're going to spend most of our energy, which is going to be very finite, just doing internal stuff and not actually getting on with the job. So <laughs> um, yeah, I really uh, implore people to sort of you know contact existing organisations, radical groups, some people might have heard of, very useful uh, organisations that you really can attend one of their gatherings. One can hear quite soon actually, um, and, 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 and sort of tap into these networks. Uh, well, I guess my my view of things comes from the perspective of, of someone who's been very involved in the planning system and the way that works and uh, I think what what's really been demonstrated over the last four or five years is where the planning system is failing us in a big way and, and really kind of identifying those sort of areas uh, will really help us get back to a, a, like a, a focus on what do we actually need from our housing and how is the planning system <coughs> set up so that it can encourage that. Um, otherwise you know, we will just continue having big developers coming in and overturning all the kind of efforts that we're trying to do on the ground. Um, so, so sort of getting away from centralised planning systems, giving more power to communities to, to make the decisions that affect their area. I think it's a key part of what we're trying to do. I suppose one of the things that I find very striking is when you look at the continent where in many countries 
half the housing market is um, cre created by people organising their own housing one way or another. They're not necessarily building it, but they're certainly in a position to take the major decisions about what, where, how much, what cost, and so on. And recently, I, were, I was with others in um, Berlin, which is amazing because 10% um, of new housing output there is organised through co-housing groups or co-ops. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, 500 dwellings a year, I think, of which 10% are um, co-ops uh, organising themselves and building. Now, you know, the circumstances in Berlin are very different to London uh, in lots of ways. The city owns a great deal of land, for instance, and it makes it available for this kind of activity. It doesn't uh, make it available at market costs, market values. It uh, puts a fixed price on it, and the competition for who gets it is between uh, different groups offering different benefits. So it's a, it's a, a tender on concept rather than price. So there are all sorts of really interesting things going on there which um, are coming from a very different background and context, but nevertheless I'm sure there must be things for us to learn from that. <coughs> okay, um, 